I'm going to talk about a particular kind of quantum spin liquid that's known as a U1 quantum spin liquid. And I'm going to talk about a particular symmetry, namely time reversal symmetry, that's uh, motivated by a certain set of experiments that I'll briefly describe. Um, so the work that I'm going to, so uh, yesterday's talk was uh, an overview of things that have gone on in the field for the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, but today's talk uh, will be about uh, work that we just finished doing and which is uh, uh, something that we'll eventually hopefully write a paper about. Uh, so the, the, the work that I'm going to talk about is done with my student, uh, Chong Wong, who's a uh, graduate student, a PhD student at MIT. Uh, OK. Uh, oh, the, I can't move the thing this way, too. This also doesn't work. What should I do? Maybe I should just remove this. Uh, yeah, you could try that. But then you have to operate it from. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's a point of view about solid state physics, which is actually very, very stimulating and very interesting. It's a point of view that I like to take in thinking about many phenomena. Uh, so let's. Uh, Think about what's happening inside a solid from the point of view of a microbe that's living inside the solid. Right? This microbe uh, will assume is a particle physicist and cannot do very high energy experiments, but can only do intermediate energy experiments. Right? So this microbe cannot discover the real universe that the solid is embedded in because it doesn't have enough energy to do very high energy, enough money to do very high energy experiments. Uh, so this microbe because it's a particle physicist, uh, will try to figure out what universe it lives in. And the universe that's present, that it lives in is the one that's presented to it by the solid. Okay? Uh, so different phases of quantum matter corresponding to different kinds of solids will then present different universes. Right? So different microbes will discover different universes because the environment inside different solids will be different. Uh, now, uh, for such a microbe uh, discovering it, the universe that it lives in, you know, it's a particle physicist, so it'll ask questions like, what's the particle data book? Right? Uh, what, what's the standard model of my universe? Now, uh, if the solid that this microbe lives in is a conventional band insulator, then in this universe, there'll be a, uh, two kinds of elementary particles. One is a massless particle. It's uh, what we call a phonon. Uh, 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 in solid state physics, it's called a phonon, it's la lattice vibrations. Uh, and there's another particle which is uh, uh, massive, and it's the, uh, it's the electron in the conduction band. Okay? So there's two kinds of particles in a conventional band insulator. Okay. Uh, now we can ask uh, sort of an interesting question are there other designer type universes? Can we imagine all kinds of universes? Uh, 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 in other words, can we imagine phase of quantum matter with uh, low energy effective field theory corresponding to anything that the field theorists dream of? Right? And in particular, we can ask are there phases where the low energy effective uh, inside a solid, where the low energy effective field theory is such is uh, essentially the same as the standard model of particle physics. Right? So this is an interesting exercise, and a number of people have uh, pondered about this uh, and. Uh, 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 developed research programs. Uh, 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 most seriously, perhaps, uh, my colleague, Xiao Gang Wen, spent a number of years pondering this question and trying to see to what extent, what aspects of the standard model may actually emerge inside a, a condensed matter system uh, as the low energy physics of a fairly ordinary condensed matter system. Okay? Uh, so I'm not going to address this kind of ambitious question at all in this talk, but uh, I'm going to restrict myself to a simpler question. Uh, which is a sub-question of this uh, grander question. Uh, so let's just focus on one aspect of the standard model, which is uh, a, a photon, light. Right? Light exists in the universe. Uh, can we think of light as an emergent excitation inside a solid state system? Right? So in other words, is there a medium right, which is such that its excitations behave 
as excitation that behaves like a photon. Okay, uh, so we imagine that we have some kind of interacting spins on a lattice, so something with short-range interactions. And we ask if, uh, at low energies, uh, if this uh, interacting spin system can settle into a phase which is such that its excitation behaves at long distances, like the photon that we that we know and love. Right. Uh, so in other words. Is can the long distance physics of uh, such a system uh, uh, be described by the emergence of Maxwell equations in, in a microscopic system, which really is that of, inter uh, say, interacting quantum spins, or uh, what's closely related to it, an in, uh, interacting uh, 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 quantum mechanical bosons, but with only short range interactions? Okay. Uh, so, Turns out quite remarkably that the answer is yes, and phases like that uh, exist. And I should uh, mention that this is actually uh, a question that could have been asked in the 19th century when people were trying postulating that everything moves, that uh, postulating the existence of an ether, uh, which is this mysterious medium whose excitation is such that uh, it behaves like light. Light was supposed to be some disturbance, some excitation of ether. There's some mysterious substance. So, okay, you know, the, the ether doesn't really exist in the form that people postulated, but as a question in kind of matter physics, we can ask, you know, is something like ether allowed to exist? Right? A, a medium uh, whose long distance physics is governed by Maxwell's equations, even, even though the short distance physics can be something completely different. Okay? And the answer is yes, indeed, such a phase exists. And uh, the examples of such phases, so they're, they're particular kinds of quantum spin liquid phases of spin systems in three space dimensions. Okay, so, so this is the kind of state that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to address some particular question about this kind of state. Uh, oh, no, this doesn't work anymore. Ah, oh, yes, it does. Thanks. I had to hit return. Uh, so let me first start, uh, just assert that uh, over the years, uh, many of us have constructed microscopic models of either interacting boson or interacting spin systems, which go into phases with these emergent photons. Uh, 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 many of us worked on this more than 10 years ago. Uh, uh, and Lisek Mutrinich is somewhere in the room. Uh, the, uh, collaboration with me, she constructed a really simple boson Hubbard model, which uh, 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 goes into such a phase. Uh, uh, and there's also very nice numerical simulations by Kedar and his collaborators uh, uh, on, on, on the model described by these people, uh, a spin system, uh, confirming the proposal that that particular spin system goes into such a phase. So I'm not going to describe these models. That's not the, uh, 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 the focus of this talk. But I merely wanted to say that models for this phenomenon actually exist. Okay. Uh, so all this work went on quite some time ago. Uh, but recently, there's been a revival of interest in, th in this kind of quantum spin liquid following a proposal uh, that this kind of spin liquid may, may actually occur in a class of materials known as quantum spin eyes. So that's what I want to describe in the next few slides. The next few slides uh, I stole uh, uh, with permission uh, from Leon Balenz, and I changed it without his permission. Uh, but uh, uh, so I want to introduce you the physics of these quantum spin eyes materials. Okay. Uh, so there's a class of materials uh, which have come to be known as the classical spin eyes. And actually, there's a serious Bangalore connection to the classical spin ice materials. I believe the term spin ice was invented by Sriram Shastri when he was here. 
uh, working on experiments uh, that uh, 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 done by Otto Ramirez uh, at Bell Labs. Uh, and uh, Sri Ramirez, a uh, graduate student, Rahul Siddharth, and I think developed the first theory of this classical spinice when, and that work was done here in this institution. Uh, so, uh, so what is spinice? So if you have icing spins that live on uh, uh, this three-dimensional lattice known as a pyroclo lattice, uh, it, it consists of corner sharing, tetrahedra, arena. Furthermore, suppose in the spin system, the interactions are such that in each tetrahedron, uh, there's a local, uh, there's a rule, uh, there's an ener uh, the energetics is such that uh, the, there's a constraint that's imposed on the spin configuration in each tetrahedron, uh, so that uh, precisely two of these spins uh, point in to the tetrahedron, I guess this one and this one, and, and the remaining two point outside. So I should say, that in, in, in the materials, in the materials that realize spin ice, these icing spins, the quantization axis for the icing spin is different on different lattice sites. And it's such that the spins either point into the tetra, any tetrahedron. Spin configuration looks something like this. And in each tetrahedron, uh, these, the interactions enforce a rule which tells you that precisely two spins point in and two point out. So that's called the ice rule uh, for spin systems. And it's enforced by uh, a very simple interaction, just a nearest neighbor icing spin interaction between these icing spins whose icing anisotropy axis is along different directions for different lattice sites. Okay? And, and, and materials that realize spin ice are things like holmium titanate, dysprosium titanate, Spin ice uh, shows this interesting phenomenon. Uh, uh, so, so, this, so these constraints uh, uh, that determine, that are enforced by this term of the Hamiltonian, uh, give, it turns out, don't give you a unique uh, ground state, but rather give you an infinite number of degenerate ground states. And so uh, there's a degenerate manifold of ground states. And the physics is determined by fluctuations within this degenerate manifold of states. Okay? So, so how should we think about this big degenerate manifold of states that satisfy these two and two out ice rule constraints? Okay. So there's a nice representation of this constraint, which is to uh, uh, simply think of the vector spin as a vector magnetic field. Let's just call it a magnetic field. And this magnetic field points in different directions on, di on different, uh, at different lattice sites. And the two and two out rule uh, uh, can then be viewed as simply the constraint that on each tetrahedron, the, the, the vector divergence or the divergence of this vector field is zero. Okay? So, so this two and two out rule is equivalent to the condition that divergence of this vector field is zero. Now, a divergence of a vector field is zero means that this field, that the field lines of this object form only closed loops. Okay? Uh, so, so uh, uh, so this is simply the condition that there's no sources or sinks for the uh, field lines of B. So a good way to parameterize the spin ice manifold is to say that, uh, that the spin, if you trace out the spin configurations by looking at things that point in uh, and uh, uh, do things of this sort, right, follow the arrows, basically. If you follow the arrows, then these the lines traced out by these arrows uh, cannot begin or end. Rather, they must form closed loops. Right? So that's a way of parametrizing all configurations in this ground state. Uh, so then the statistical mechanics of the system uh, maps to a, uh, 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 can be viewed as the statistical mechanics of closed loops that live on this lattice. Because the uh, spin configuration maps to uh, the configurations of a vector field that satisfies this divergence-free condition, which then means the corresponding field lines form closed loops. We've mapped the spin system within the spin ice manifold to some, some sort of uh, uh, loop model in statistical mechanics, where the configuration space consists of closed-oriented loops. Uh, 
No, not really. The Oh, oh, that, there's some ambiguity at short distances when two loops intersect. Uh, n n near the intersection of two loops, there's some ambiguity. Is that what you have in mind? The, Right, so so you could have, so you can encode that. that that's right. So, that's right. So, right. So you can encode that as an interaction between the loops, right? And uh, so if you're doing some long distance physics, then you'll very quickly coarse grain this loop model, and then end up with something where you hope that that sort of short distance constraint doesn't matter that much. Okay, and that seems to capture the physics of spin ice very well. Uh, okay, so this goes under the name of artificial magnetostatics because many properties of these classical spin ices in this loop configuration, once in which these, this two and two old constraint is not satisfied. Uh, for instance, if you have a defect at a head round in which there's three instants and one out spin or the other way around, then these defect at a head round correspond to sources of uh, places where divergence B is not zero. Uh, so if you call B a magnetic field, uh, then places where divergence B is not zero should be called a magnetic monopole. Okay? So these defect at a head round correspond to magnetic monopole configurations, uh, point like magnetic monopole configurations in this artificial magnetostatic problem, okay? And this was, uh, 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 and, and race experiments to probe these were proposed uh, uh, by Castelnova, Moisner, and Sondi some number of years back, and there's a wide variety of experiments where these sorts of defect tetrahedra have been detected and shown that they have properties very similar to what you expect for a magnetic monopole. So that's the sort of standard story about uh, spin ice. Uh, so the focus of this talk is quantum spin ice. So it turns out this, uh, that there are new kinds of spin ice materials where quantum effects on the icing spins are clearly important. So some examples of uh, materials in this class are your terbium titanate, uh, uh, which is a member of the standard spin ice family, but uh, it turns out to be such that uh, there's quantum effects on the icing spins. And there's other candidates which are based on pseudemium which is somewhat, it's a slightly different family of materials, uh, pseudemium zirconate and pseudemium tenoxide. Uh, uh, but uh, these also sit on pyrochlor lattices, and these also look like they satisfy, the, uh, to a reasonable extent, uh, the, the spin ice constraints, but they also have large number, large quantum fluctuations on top of the spin ice uh, constraint. So there's a wide variety of experiments, uh, somewhat bewildering, which I won't uh, explain at all, uh, in this talk, uh, except to say there's many deviations from classical spin ice behavior at low temperature. For instance, in the terbium titanate, uh, neutron scattering sees a lot of continuum scattering, uh, uh, unlike what you expect in an ordered phase, but uh, perhaps suggestive of some sort of uh, liquid behavior. Uh, likewise, in the spisodemium compound, uh, in inelastic neutron scattering, there's large weights seen at frequencies that are much, much bigger than the temperature. As you would expect, there's a lot of quantum fluctuations, uh, because, uh, 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 but unlike what you would expect in the classical magnet. So it's sort of suggestive evidence uh, based on uh, these kinds of experiments that there may be quantum effects in these materials. Uh, but in euterbium titanate, uh, uh, one can go beyond just providing suggestive evidence and indeed the Hamiltonian uh, for the system. Uh, uh, so the first thing to recognize is that uh, the moments, magnetic moments in these uh, systems are f moments uh, based on f orbitals. And uh, it's known from chemistry that this f orbital is not very extended in real space. And therefore, you expect that the nearest neighbor model is a pretty good approximation to the real system. Okay? So you can try to constrain the most general nearest neighbor Hamiltonian involving these spins. Uh, uh, from symmetry, and people did that some number of years back. And there's a num bunch of terms that you can write down that are symmetry allowed, but with uh, unknown coupling constants. Okay. So this first term 
is the classical nearest neighbor spin ice. Uh, this enforces the ice rule. Uh, if any of these other terms are present and are sizable, then there are, uh, these terms, these other terms don't commute with the classical spin ice uh, uh, part of the Hamiltonian. And therefore, uh, they will induce quantum fluctuations into the ground state. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't know microscopically what's making this quantum and not uh, dysprosium. Uh, but, you know, experimentally, as I'll show in the next slide, uh, it's been, it's possible, it turned out to be possible to determine uh, the actual values of all these coupling constants through, through experiments. We'll see that it's, uh, it's quantum. And on top of this, for completeness, I should say that you should add dipolar interactions. After all, these are dipole moments. They'll interact through dipole interactions. Uh, and that plays some role in the physics of classical spin ice. Uh, perhaps it doesn't in these other systems. Uh, OK, so, so uh, in a tour de force experiment, uh, I guess the experiment is done by Kate Ross and Bruce Collar. Uh, a, a Hamilton, the Hamiltonian for a terbium 2 titanium 207 was determined very, very accurately. And the main idea was uh, uh, that the exchange scales in this material are, were known to be very, very small on the order of a few Kelvin. So what, people, what, what the experiment did was to polarize all the spins with a magnetic field and then do an elastic neutron scattering to measure the dispersion of a single spin flip uh, in, in, this high, uh, in this fully polarized uh, 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 state. And from the dispersion of the, by fitting the dispersion of that single spin flip uh, excitation to a, uh, to, an, to a spin Hamiltonian uh, of the fo uh, form described in the previous slide, they were able to pull out uh, the detailed values of all the coupling constants. Right? Uh, so the crucial thing, there are two aspects to recognize. The first is that the biggest coupling constant is Definitely the classical spin ice interaction, the JZZ term. It's 0.17 MeV. Uh, this M is milli electron volts for the sake of the high energy people in the room. Uh, but there's also uh, a, a huge JZ plus minus, which is a term of the form SZ uh, on one side times S plus or S minus on neighboring site. And that term is nearly 85% of the dominant spin ice term. Right? Now, this term. Uh, does not commute, uh, the JZ plus minus term does not commute with this, uh, with the classical part of the Hamiltonian, and therefore this sizable, it's clearly a quantum Hamiltonian. So empirically, we know that in this system, uh, there's a huge amount of quantum fluctuation, and we have to treat the problem as a quantum spin system rather than as a classical spin system. Okay. Oh, these are some fixed numbers. It's like 1 plus i and things of that sort. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, so, so these, these spins are strongly, the strong spin orbit coupling in these materials. So the microscopics is very, very complicated, right? So the spins are strong spin orbit coupling that makes the exchange far from Heisenberg like. Okay. Uh, so these are really J moments. Anyway, we don't, the, 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 at some level, the point is that given that we know the Hamiltonian, we don't have to understand how to derive it from first principles. It's been derived experimentally for us, for, right? Uh, it's a reliable determination from experiments, so, uh, you know, we don't need to delve into the chemistry more. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, we can maybe discuss that later. Uh, you know, I guess the question is from chemistry point of view, where does this come from? Right? So I'm not going to address that in the talk. Actually, I'm not even going to address this Hamiltonian in the talk. All this is by way of motivation. And, and I, actually, the main point I want to emphasize about this Hamiltonian is really that it's complicated, uh, that it's extremely complicated. Even though we know the Hamiltonian very reliably, it's so complicated that it's unlikely that we certainly don't know anything reliable about the properties of this Hamiltonian, and it's unlikely that we're going to know anything anytime soon that's reliable about the properties of a complicated Hamiltonian of this type. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, that, that you can estimate from the size of the moment. I, do, I think it's smaller than, it's a lot smaller than the JZ plus minus. That, that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, that, so, so I should also point out that the J plus minus and the J plus plus are not small, they are one third of the dominant coupling, okay? So there's all kinds of couplings in this Hamiltonian uh, which are big. And so clearly we should think, call this material a quantum spin-ice material. It, it's spin-ice but with a huge amount of quantum fluctuations built into it and that will determine the physics of the system, okay? So what can we say uh, quite generally about quantum fluctuations in the spin-ice manifold? Uh, so one thing that will happen is that if the restriction of the spin-ice manifold is legitimate, then we expect that these magnetic field lines will now fluctuate quantum mechanically right, within this manifold. That there'll be quantum motion, uh, mix, mixing of uh, quantum mechanical mixing of states within this manifold. And if these fields have zero line tension, if these field lines have zero line tension, then we end up with a quantum spin liquid with now an emergent U1 gauge field whose magnetic field lines are precisely these fluctuating uh, spin configurations. So this is, a, is a, a way in which this uh, U1 spin liquid that I advertised in the beginning of the talk might emerge in a real material. It's a three-dimensional state. Uh, it's called a U1 quantum spin liquid because what emerges is uh, a U1 gauge field and the, uh, uh, just like the ordinary electromagnetism. Uh, and the excitations of this phase, would uh, there would be an artificial gapless photon uh, 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 you know, if these, line, if these lines indeed fluctuate without line tension, then that corresponds to a propagating photon, right? Uh, there will be a linear dispersing photon. Uh, in addition, there will be gapped, a gapped magnetic monopole excitation corresponding to this defect tetrahedra, the three in, three in, one out, or the three out, one in defect tetrahedra. I'll call that the M particle. And, and uh, furthermore, there will be yet, uh, yet another kind of excitation which corresponds to an internal electric charge you know, once we have electromagnetism emerging, have both electric and magnetic charge. Charge is also emerging. Uh, uh, so there'll be other gap point particle excitations, which I'll call the electric particle, uh, and which are dual in some sense to these magnetic monopole excitations. So there's many, many ongoing experiments to look for this photon, and there's many interesting suggestions for how to look for it. Uh, uh, the, uh, as of now, there's nothing conclusive yet in the experiments, but maybe in the future there will be. Uh, but that's the situation, okay? So what are we supposed to do theoretically given that this is the situation in experiments, right? Uh, now the Hamiltonian itself, it's great that we know the Hamiltonian, but it's so complicated that uh, it's beyond the reach of any analytical or numerical methods that we currently have that is reliable. Right? We can try to do some approximate calculation based on the Hamiltonian, and maybe we'll learn something. And indeed, there's a large literature trying to do that. But what I want to do is to use this uh, state of affairs to motivate general theoretical questions about this kind of phase, okay? Uh, so there's some crucial questions uh, uh, of a general conceptual nature that you can pose. Uh, so what are the distinct kinds of quantum spin liquids with symmetry that are possible for this kind of Hamiltonian? Okay, so that's a very general question. And in trying to address this question, we are aided or perhaps hindered by the fact that this, this Hamiltonian has very little physical symmetry. Right? There's clearly no spin rotation symmetry of any kind. And the only physical symmetry is time reversal times some space group. Okay? And because of spin orbit coupling, the space group symmetry is linked to some internal discrete symmetry in spin space the system may have. Okay? And uh, suppose we answer this first question, uh, then we can then ask, uh, how do we theoretically access these distinct quantum spin liquids, and how should we distinguish uh, these different kinds of spin liquids in experiments? Okay, uh, so these are some questions at a very general level that we can ask in the absence of uh, any ability to solve the particular Hamiltonian that is presented to us by the experiments. Okay, uh, so I'm going to focus in this talk on time reversal. Uh, even this, these sets of questions are fairly complicated, as we'll see. Uh, so I'm going to ignore the space group symmetry completely and focus just on time reversal 
and uh, uh, try to address uh, th this this kind of question by focusing by, uh, 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 by focusing uh, simply on time reversal. Okay, so the focus of the talk is going to be on time reversal symmetric U1 quantum spin liquids. Okay, so what kinds of such spin liquids might exist, and uh, how do we access them? What are their physical properties? Okay, so I'm going to restrict to phases where the only gapless excitation is the photon. And in particular, the E and M excitations, electric and magnetic charges, are gapped. Okay? Uh, now, to, to distinguish different phases, it's enough to focus on just these E and M particles, because once you know what the E and M are doing, they determine what the photon is doing. Okay? You can create an electric field line by taking two, uh, an electric charge and an anti-electric charge and moving them apart and annihilating them, likewise for magnetic field lines. So the claim, which I'll hopefully justify in this talk, is that there are precisely eight distinct such time reversal symmetric U1 quantum spin liquids. In other words, we can classify all such phases uh, uh, completely. However, these eight distinct phases become the same phase if time reversal is broken. So if there's no symmetry in the problem, it's not that this phase disappears, but it's pretty amazing that even in the absence of any symmetry, this phase survives and has a gapless photon. So the gaplessness of the photon in this phase has nothing to do with symmetry. You can break all the symmetries and the photon will still be gapless. It has something to do with the structure of the entanglement of the ground state wave function. It has nothing to do with symmetry. But uh, when you have no symmetry at all, there's precisely one such phase. But once you add time reversal symmetry, there are eight distinct such phases. Okay? And one of these is presumably realized in, in these materials if we are lucky. Okay? And the question is, which one? Now, it turns out that the work that I'm going to talk about uh, has extremely strong connections to uh, recent progress in understanding interacting uh, topological insulators of the kind that Lasik talked about in his talk, uh, both uh, bosonic and uh, electronic topological insulators in the presence of strong interactions. Uh, to the extent possible, I will not uh, uh, use this connection uh, in most of the talk, since uh, you know to build up that background would take a long time. Uh, but once in a while, for the sake of the experts, I will make some connections with that body of work as well, because uh, some, some of the work, uh, the, some of the thinking that goes into this result, I will have to invoke uh, some results from uh, some. Uh, some results from the theory of interacting topological insulators, but mostly not. OK. Uh, so let's start with some trivial observations. Right? So the microscopic Hilbert space is some spin Hilbert space. Right? So all excitations uh, created by local operators in the physical Hilbert space must be bosons, because spins are different sites commute, and they're bosons. Okay? So in the UV, in the microscopic Hilbert space, Local operators can only create bosonic excitations. Now, the emergent excitations, the E and M particles, are not created by local operators. That's because I have an emergent, uh, ele emergent electromagnetism. For instance, if I want to create an electric charge in, in electromagnetism, I can't just create an electric charge. I also have to create the electric fields that come out of the electric charge. Right? So Gauss law forces the creation of electric fields. And the fancy mathematical way of saying this is that the uh, action of you know, the electric charge creation operator is not gauge invariant. What it really means is that you can't just create the electric charge, but you also have to create the field lines that come out of it. But these field lines extend out to infinity. That means that I can't, through ordinary operations, I can't create the electric charge. To create an electric charge, I have to do something non-local in the entire system. Right? I have to create electric field lines that go off to infinity. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so the E and M part, and the same story holds for the magnetic particle. So the E and M particles are not created by local operators. Uh, so given that uh, there's no restriction that we can necessarily place on their statistics, and they may either be boson or fermion. Okay? Uh, they're not constrained in the same way that physical excitations are constrained. Okay? So time reversal, since I have time reversal as a symmetry, let's ask about how time reversal acts. Now, when time reversal acts on physical states in a bosonic system, it does so in a simple way. And in particular, uh, uh, if I square the time reversal operator, 
So first, I should point out that time reversal is, unit, is an anti-unitary symmetry. It's one of the basic things about quantum mechanics. Uh, 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 but T squared, when it acts uh, for a bosonic system, when it acts on physical states, it just gives me back plus one. That's the standard uh, story. This should be contrasted with electronic systems where T squared is minus one, and then there's a Kalmar's degeneracy, all those say, uh, interesting things. Bosons are quite trivial that way. T squared is just plus one, and time reversal is realized in some very simple manner. Okay? So on physical states, T squared is necessarily plus one. Uh, now let's ask about the action of time reversal on these emergent particles. Uh, Again, the trivial observation is that the electric charge is even under time reversal, while the magnetic charge is odd under time reversal. Okay? Uh, now, this means that the electric charge, the E particle, and its time reverse partner, which I'll call T times E, differ only by a local operator because they've not changed the electric fields in going from E to T times E. Right? The electric fields are the same. So E and T times E are, are related through a local physical operator. This, but E itself is not local, and therefore T squared can have any value when it acts on E, and in particular T squared could be minus one, in which case the E particle may, may have a Kramer's degeneracy. Okay? That's allowed to happen. In contrast, for the magnetic particle, M and TM are not related by a local operator since I had to change the direction of the magnetic fields everywhere in, 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 in this medium, and therefore there is no meaning to whether the M particle is commerce or not. And more formally, what this means is that T squared acting on M can be shifted by doing a gauge transformation on the M particle. Okay? Uh, uh, so remember that this business of whether something is local or non-local, another way of saying that, the more formal way of saying that is to ask whether they are gauge invariant or not gauge invariant. Right? Uh, so what we learn is that the E particle could be commerce, it doesn't need to be, but it could be a commerce doublet. Well, for the M particle, the question is meaningless. Okay? T squared can be shifted to have any value by a gauge transformation. So what we've learned so far is that E or M may be fermion, they could be boson or fermion, and that the E may be uh, either a commerce singlet or a commerce doublet. But it must always be true that if you make composite particles out of these uh, E and M particles, which have zero electric charge and zero magnetic charge, then those objects are local. They are gauge invariant objects, and they, are they should be created by local physical operators acting on the Hilbert space, which means that these composite excitations with zero electric and zero magnetic charge must be bosons, and they must transform trivially under time reversal. Okay? Since bosons are in the physical Hilbert space, the bosons will just have T squared equals plus one. Yeah, we'll talk about things like that. that, that they can, you, you, the full spectrum, you have to think about those bone states, the dions. Um, uh, to the extent possible, I've avoided talking about them, but you have to. Uh, they'll show up in some guys somewhat later on. So let's try to, to make some take some initial steps towards understanding all possible time reversal symmetric Q1 quantum spin liquids. So clearly there are two broad classes that we can think about. Uh, let's focus on the M particle. It can either be a boson or a fermion. It's not allowed to have any Kramer structure. So the only two possibilities for the M particle, it would seem, are that it's either a boson or a fermion. So let's discuss these two cases separately uh, and see what we get. Okay. Uh, so if the boson, uh, if the monopole is a boson, we can immediately write down a set of four distinct uh, uh, phases of matter of these U1 spin liquids. Depending on the statistics of the E particle, it can, it's either a boson or a fermion, and on the realization of time reversal. Either the E particle is uh, Kramer's trivial or it's a Kramer's double, meaning T squared is plus one or T squared is minus one. So that immediately gives us uh, four distinct phases for these time reversal symmetric Q1 spin liquids. So I'm going to introduce a notation that's very useful as bookkeeping. Uh, let's label these different phases by what the E and M particles are doing. So EB, MB means that E is a boson, M is a boson. EF, MB means that E is a fermion and M is a boson. EBT, MB means that E is a boson. And this T means that it's a Kramer's doublet. 
uh, and M is just a boson and likewise here. Right? So that's the state. Okay. Uh, so all so this much has come out of very, very simple arguments, right? not uh, 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 anything very detailed. Yeah. There's been many more possibilities, yeah. L luckily, in the experimental system, the only internal symmetry is time reversal. Right? So it's enough to solve this problem in that case. Yeah, so the only internal symmetry is also space group symmetry, which I'm not discussing simply because it's complicated. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, in fact, later we'll see that there are other constraints that prevent the realization. But all these phases, it turns out, are, are realizable phases. Okay. So some of these phases are actually obtained through familiar constructions. So I. I asserted at the beginning of the talk that we had microscopic models for this kind of phase. In fact, all the microscopic models uh, all, all, you know, indeed have time reversal as a physical symmetry, but they all end up constructing the same phase, and they construct this phase E, B, and B. And in the context of the pyroclore lattice, this realized, for instance, by the XXZ spin half model on the pyroclore lattice that uh, uh, Mike Humble and collaborators uh, uh, studied and that Kedar uh, did this nice numerics on. Uh, uh, now these other phases, uh, two of these other phases, for instance, EBT MB or EFT MB, have a Kramer's doublet uh, bosonic electric charge or a Kramer's doublet fermionic electric charge. So these are very naturally addressed, uh, accessed theoretically through the Schwinger boson or Schwinger fermion representation of the physical spins that may be familiar to many people in the room. And that's something that I briefly mentioned in yesterday's talk. So this natural way to construct these phases, at least at the level of uh, effective field theory. Right? Uh, there's no microscopic models which can be reliably shown to go into these phases, but we know that they can exist. OK. So let's try and understand these four phases uh, from a physical point of view. It's, you know, from general arguments, we know that these four phases can exist. But let's try to think about the wave functions for these phases. And it's useful to think in terms of fluctuating electric or magnetic field lines. Right? So at low energies, below the uh, gap, the electric gap and the magnetic gap, the electric and magnetic field lines both form closed loops. So you can represent the wave function of the system either on the electric basis or on the magnetic basis. And in either basis, it will be a fluctuating loop gas of oriented loops. Right? Uh, now in the electric picture, uh, the E field lines form oriented loops at low energies. And the ground state will be some superposition of oriented electric loops. And in this uh, simplest phase, the EBMB phase, constructed in all the existing microscopic models, it'll, uh, uh, the, the ground state is a, is a very simple superposition of these oriented electric loops with positive definite weights. Okay? And that will not be the case once we go to some of these other phases. So let's think about phases in which the E particle is a Kramer's doublet, for instance, EBT, MB. So how should we think about the wave function for that phase? So it, you know, turns out there's a very, very simple and very physical way of thinking about the wave function for this phase. Let's again take the superposition of electric field lines, electric field configurations. Now the E particle is the open end of an electric field line. Right? So the electric charge is the source of sink of electric fields. Okay? Uh, what we want is to ensure that any time you cut open an electric field loop and expose an open end, that that open end has a Kramer's degeneracy associated with it. Okay? Now, uh, from various, uh, from, the, from the history of magnetism, quantum magnetism, we know how to ensure that. So there is a phase of matter in one dimension known as the Haldane uh, spin chain. It's a, 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 a spin one, it's a chain of spin one degrees of freedom interacting antiferromagnetically with each other. And this phase has the very interesting property that it's gapped in the bulk. This is a so-called Haldane gap. Uh, so the bulk is trivial. There's no exotic excitations. It's just gapped. But if you cut, so, so it looks like this. But if you cut this Haldane chain open and it leave behind an exposed end, then at the end, it develops a dangling spin half moment, which is a Kramer's doublet. Right? So that's been known since the 1980s. And the physical picture is that each spin one should be regarded as it's useful to view each spin one as a composite of two spin halves. 
and each spin half then forms a singlet bond with a, with a spin half from a neighboring spin one, and uh, you uh, pack the lattice this way. But then at the end, if you have an open end, then uh, this, mem this spin half member of this uh, full spin one doesn't have a partner to form a singlet with, and so it has a dangling spin half moment. Oh, just your nearest neighbor, at, uh, the Holdane spin chain, SI dot is SI plus one, where SI is spin one. Well, you know, that's the classic Holdane spin chain. Yeah. Any arbitrary situation, so long as you're in the same phase as the nearest neighbor Holdane chain. So there's a variety of perturbations that you can make. So as they preserve some symmetry. You need some symmetry to be preserved. And in this case, you need, yeah, uh, uh, because we're talking about time reversal invariant systems, let's say we have time reversal symmetry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's the same kind of picture also describes the 1D Kitai minor chain. All right, we can talk about that later. But for the spin chain, this old stuff, it's very well understood. And uh, so long as time reversal is, you know, many symmetries can protect this dangling thing, but in the present context, all we need is time reversal symmetry. So the way then to think about the electric field lines when the electric charge is a Cromer's doublet is to imagine that these electric field lines are stuffed inside with Holdane chains. Right? So then the electric field loops fluctuate, but the Holdane chain, when it's closed, is gapped. So it doesn't do anything uh, as such, except when you cut this electric field line open, and then you expose this end of the Holdane chain, and you expose a Cromer's doublet. And the, but the open end of the electric field line is the E particle. Therefore, you convert the E particle into a Cromer's doublet. Right? So in terms of the wave function, that's the difference between this uh, EBT MB phase and this EBMB phase. Right? Uh, the electric field lines are stuffed with Holdane chains. OK. Uh, but what if the E particle is a fermion, for instance, such as in EFMB or the CFTMB? Uh, well, it turns out we can understand the difference in the structure of the wave function uh, in this case, too. Here we should really think about the electric field loops as electric field lines, not as point-like lines, but as thickened lines, uh, uh, namely as ribbons. And there's a phase factor associated with some topological property of these ribbons. Okay? And in particular, uh, uh, given a thickened line, a ribbon, right, there's a uh, topological uh, 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 quantity known as the self-linking of a ribbon. So what it means is that you take the two ends of the ribbon and you ask about how these, these two ends define two different curves. You ask about how the linking number of these two different curves with each other. Right? So how many times they link with each other, right? the two ends of the ribbon. Now each time, so the prescription is that each time there's a self-linking uh, of, uh, of the ribbon, of this closed ribbon, you put a minus sign in the wave function. Right? Uh, and the claim is that uh, if you look at a superposition of electric field lines with weights, uh, which is such that there's, there's a sign, the sign structure of the wave function is such that there's a minus sign for the self-linking, as so the self-linking of these ribbons, then that is enough to ensure that the open endpoint of, su of such a ribbon is a fermion. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go through the proof of that statement. It uh, requires drawing a lot of pictures. But the sequence of pictures is to draw things like this and focus on a particular plane. So these are the two endpoints of the ribbon. And uh, what I've shown here is simply that if you rotate this ribbon by 2 pi, you acquire a phase of minus 1 because of this uh, minus 1 associated with the self-linking. Okay? Uh, uh, the main point to emphasize is that this phase one can give a geometric argument that this phase ensures that the open endpoint is a fermion. Okay? So geometrically, we then understand the structure of the different of the wave functions for these different phases. So as an aside for the experts, let me uh, give you an interesting point of view on these uh, four different phases. You know, it's very simple to distinguish these phases based on what the electric charge is doing. Is it a Cromer singlet or Cromer's doublet? Is it a boson or fermion? Now, suppose you were a magnetic charge point of view person. Right? How should you distinguish these different phases? The magnetic charge is always a boson in all these four phases. Nevertheless, 
there must be a way to state the distinction also from the magnetic point of view. Okay? And that's where this topological insulator business comes in. It turns out that these distinct, uh, these four distinct time reversal symmetric U and spin liquids correspond to distinct interacting bosonic topological insulators formed by these monopoles. Okay? Uh, in LASIK talk, you heard about bosonic topological insulators, which are bosonic generalizations of the, of the electronic topological insulators. Uh, 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 so we now know, based on work in the last two or three years, that bosons can form these topological insulators. And it turns out that in the present context, uh, the, uh, the distinct boson topological insulators formed by these monopoles is what gives you these distinct kinds of electric charges in, uh, 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 in the gauge theory. Yeah. Oh, if you in if in addition you have a Kramer's doublet, you have to stuff these with holding chains. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're not always bosons. I said they could be either boson or fermion, and I'm going to discuss the boson case first. I'll come to the fermion case then. Uh, in any case, the boson case is probably what's at all pertinent to the quantum spin ice system. Uh, but the fermion case, for completeness, one should discuss that too. OK. Uh, so I've described four phases so far. Uh, it turns out there's a fifth phase uh, where the boson is still a uh, monopole is still a boson. Uh, so this uh, has already been described in the literature uh, uh, with a name that's not quite appropriate. It's called a topological Uh For historical reasons, I'll stick with this name. It was proposed by Payson and Balance uh, some years back. And the idea is to start with this EFT MB phase, where the electric charge is a Kramer's fermion. Okay? Now, uh, time reversal symmetric uh, fermions, with, uh, or, uh, which are Kramer's doublets, we know can form topological band structures or trivial band structures. Right? So suppose they f it forms a topological band structure. That's what they, these people said. Then it, you get a new time reversal symmetric U1 quantum spin liquid. And they initially proposed this for a particular material, yttrium iridium 7 It's now, uh, now believed that uh, this proposal doesn't work at all for this material. But nevertheless, the proposal has stimulated a lot of activity. So this is a new phase. I'm going to denote this as EFT MB uh, theta for uh, with the subscript theta for reasons that will become clear in a minute. There's two consequences of uh, two properties of this phase that I should mention right away. The first is that because the E particle has formed a, a, a topological band, uh, just like with electron topological insulators, in this phase, at the surface, you'll have a Dirac cone of the E particle, okay? which will then be coupled to the U1 gauge field that's also there in this phase. Okay? Uh, and second, uh, and I'm going to explain this in a minute, uh, this topological band structure of this E particle uh, has a dramatic effect on the M particle it actually endows it with internal electric charge of half. So this is a case where the monopole becomes a dion of the kind that you were asking, or not quite of the kind that you're asking me, but it's roughly that kind. OK, so let's understand this last statement. Uh, so this last statement really comes from uh, uh, the understanding that's developed over the years on the properties of topological band slaters. Uh, uh, and I think Joel mentioned this earlier today. Uh, so if you take a topological band insulator and couple it to a U1 gauge field, then it's known from uh, uh, work by uh, Shou Liang Chi and collaborators and uh, Joel's group as well, that there's this uh, so-called theta term in the electromagnetic response, uh, theta times E dot B times the coefficient. Uh, time reversal symmetry is possible if theta is either 0 or pi. And trivial insulators have theta equals 0, while topological band insulators have theta equals pi. Now, it's also been known for a long time, from the late 1970s, that uh, uh, this sort of theta term has the effect that it induces electric charge on a magnetic monopole. Uh, that's known as the Witten effect. And it's very, very simple to show. You take this term in the Lagrangian, uh, proportional to E dot B, and let's restrict to static configurations. Right? So then we can write E as gradient minus gradient A0 dot B, and then we integrate by parts to transfer the gradient to the B. Then we get a coupling 
uh, A0 times divergence B. That means that the divergence B, which is uh, proportional to the monopole strength, acts as a source of electric fields. Uh, so it endorsed the monopole uh, with charge theta over 2 pi. And since theta is pi, endorsed the monopole with electric charge half. OK? Uh, OK. So we have this new phase. Now it turns out that this new phase is a remarkably simple wave function. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you don't, because we understand the boson topology considers so that there's nothing, there's no extra possibility there. Um, uh, so, so far, the wave function that I've described have been in terms of electric field loops. Now, to describe this phase, it turns out that it's simplest to describe it in a magnetic basis and think, think in terms of magnetic field lines. Below the monopole gap, these magnetic field lines will form closed loops. Okay? And uh, now the crucial observation is that the Witten effect tells us that the monopoles carry internal electric charge of half. And what this means is that when two magnetic field lines link, that there's a phase of minus one. So the reason is that suppose you have an existing magnetic field line uh, uh, which has two pi magnetic flux, and then you want to create a new magnetic field line that you know links around with the first case that goes around and, and comes uh, that loops around it. Right? So the way that you would do that is create a monopole antimonopole pair out of the vacuum, take the monopole all the way around and annihilate it. Okay, but the monopole carries electric charge half, so when it goes around the two pi flux line, it picks up uh, picks up a phase of minus one. Okay, so consequently. Uh, the ground state uh, is a superposition of oriented magnetic loops with a phase which is such that when any two of these loops link, this, you get minus one. Okay? So this is a really, really simple wave function. There's no reference to fermions or Kramers or anything. Right? I just take uh, oriented loops with this linking phase, and the claim is that this gives you this phase where the electric charge is a Kramers doublet fermion and has topological band structure. So let's contrast this with the, with the most trivial of these phases, the EBMB phase. Now in the magnetic field representation, this phase, the wave function is also a superposition of oriented magnetic loops, but with positive weights. Now the only difference in the wave function uh, now is that there's a minus sign for the linking phase, and this changes the state dramatically. Uh, it converts the E particle into a Kramers fermion and the topological band structure. Okay? Because this is a, you know, I've derived this result for you, I've argued for the correctness of this result in a, from a certain logic, but I think the result is very surprising, and so it's good to try and understand this from a different point of view. If we just start with this wave function and then derive the fact that the E particle is a Kramer's formula. Okay? And it turns out that exercise also addresses all kinds of questions in the theory of topological insulators, but uh, let me not uh, describe that. That's right, yeah. Uh, no, so the electromagnetic field is uh, not, uh, we don't treat that quantum mechanically. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, that's right. In principle, it's that phase, yeah. but. You know, uh, yeah. If you did that, then the then the real monopole and a real topological insulator will be a, a this Witten dion with half charge, and that will have consequences. Right? Now, this is a serious issue in a spin liquid phase where everything is quantum mechanical. Right? Uh, so let's understand this better. Right. So why exactly does this minus sign have these dramatic effects? Right. So first of all. Uh, my, this minus sign linking phase for magnetic loops, it's clear that it's equivalent to the statement that the monopoles are dions with electric charge plus minus half. Okay? So let's, to argue why the electric particle has, that is doing all these weird things, let's consider a bound state of a charge half dion with a charge half anti dion, okay? with the opposite magnetic charge, but with the same electric charge. Right? Now, this bound state carries magnetic charge zero, 
but it carries electric charge one. So we must identify this with the E particle. Okay? So if we can understand the properties of this bone state of a charge half dion and a charge half anti dion, then we understand the structure of the electric particle. So how does this behave under time reversal? Okay. So it turns out that we had understood this in the context of some work on top interacting topological insulators, and so had Mitlitsky, Kane, and Fisher. So let me uh, uh, go through this very quickly. Because this argument is, I think, very uh, uh, interesting and important. Uh, so this, under time reversal, the dion and anti-dion with the same electric charge transform into each other, because the only thing that's different is the, is the magnetic charge. Okay? So this one half dion becomes this minus one half uh, anti-dion and vice versa. Okay? Now the crucial point when we think about the bound state of these two is that these two particles see each other as relative magnetic monopoles. They more or less behave as though one is a charge and the other is a monopole. Okay? Uh, uh, and in particular, you can do a simple calculation which of the kind that I believe was first done by Meghnad Saha for in the context of a charged particle moving in the background of a monopole. Uh, calculate the electromagnetic field angular momentum and you can show that in this, for this configuration, uh, the bone state of these two, that the electromagnetic field angular momentum is a half integer. Now, using this, you can then show that under the action of T squared, this orbital part of the angular momentum leads to T squared equals minus one, so this bound state is a Kramer's doublet. Right? Now, furthermore, you can continue this line of argument uh, and uh, uh, ask about the statistics of this bound state, and you'll see that this bound state is necessarily a fermion. Okay? Uh, so that's why, that's how you, that's the line of reasoning that lets you go back and start, start with this minus sign linking phase and infer that the electric particle must be a Kramer's doublet fermion. Incidentally, there's also the proof that the only insulators uh, uh, which have theta equals pi electromagnetic response are topological insulators of Kramer's doublet electrons with spin orbit coupling. Okay? Uh, and there's a known perturbative proof, doesn't require band structure. Okay, so we now understand that the, this sort of uh, wave, loop wave function is uh, uh, a wave function for this exotic phase, uh, topological Morton slater, where the electric charge is a fermion, Kramer's doublet, and has topological band structure. Right? But this sort of phase we know has non-trivial surface states that are protected by time reversal. Right? The electric particle forms a Dirac cone. So there's now a prediction that we can make for numerics. You take this wave function, of loops, uh, and you do the kind of numerical calculation that LASIK talked about this morning. Uh, create in the numerics an interface with the vacuum or with a, a loop, uh, uh, you know, with another state in which there is, there is no such linking phase. And the prediction is that uh, this wave function uh, at, uh, will lead to a, to, a, to a boundary state at that interface, which has the power law correlations characteristic of a Fermi surface with Dirac cones. Now, without all this reasoning, it's not at all obvious if I just gave you this wave function that that kind of thing will happen, right? that there are somehow fermions in the system. Right? There's minus signs. <laughs> so it turns out this minus sign is precisely what you need to get boundary, so uh, there are cones. No, but that, yeah, so LASIK, studied very, very similar wave function in two dimensions. Right? Anyway, a LASIK student assured me that he can do the calculations. So <laughs> that, uh, OK. So to summarize, uh, with the bosonic monopole, there's five distinct phases. The first four were inferred through very simple arguments. And the fifth one is a bit of a twist. It requires putting. Uh, the, uh, the, an emergent Kramer's fermion into a topological band. And the reason for this index theta is because this now has a theta term uh, in, in the low energy Lagrangian. Okay. Uh, so now let's ask the question. Let's, uh, so, so that's all there is. Uh, so the previous slide, these are the only phases that can exist with the bosonic monopole. Uh, uh, but now let's turn to the other possibility that the M particle is a fermion and ask what can happen. So the first question to ask is whether the E particle can also be a fermion. Okay? Uh, and it turns out 
and this is a total surprise, that the answer is no. Uh, so this kind of U-N gauge theory, uh, all Fermi on U-N gauge theory, where there's Fermi statistics for both E and M, it looks consistent, right? But it turns out it's not consistent. It's not an emergible theory in any three plus one dimensional condensed matter system, okay? Uh, I don't have a great understanding of this. We stumbled upon this result uh, as part of a different project of classifying and tracking electron topological insulators. Uh, and the key idea behind the proof is that we can think of such a phase as a gauged version of a putative topological insulator of fermionic E particles. And then we could show that such a putative topological insulator does not have a consistent surface in the right Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, now, subsequently, very, very recently, uh, people have argued that this kind of theory can actually arise as the boundary of a four plus one dimensional system, uh, but it cannot arise in a strictly three plus one dimensional magnet. Okay? So it turns out that in the field theory language, this has some kind of anomaly, what I think the field theorists call a gravitational anomaly, but of a kind that uh, apparently was not described in the field theory literature. So we just stumbled upon this and by doing some topological insider stuff. Well, the implication for the current project is that, uh, you know, there's one phase that uh, one might have thought could exist, but it actually can't. This is an example of a field theory that you may write down, but it's never going to emerge in an th ordinary condensed matter system. Right? It's not emergible uh, in the right Hilbert space. So that simplifies our task, which means that we know that E must be a boson. And uh, since I'm running out of time, let me just give you the answer. The distinct possibilities are generated by endowing the fermionic monopole with topological band structure. Okay? Uh, so the, let me sort of very quickly tell you what these are. Uh, so this part, I'll be quick because uh, it's somewhat technical uh, and it may probably not that relevant to the spin system in any case. So the key idea is to notice that the monopole transforms under a global sim uh, under a symmetry which looks like this. There's a gauge U1 because the monopole carries magnetic charge. There's a magnetic gauge transformation. And uh, that's direct product with time reversal. And it's direct product because the magnetic charge is odd under a time reversal. Okay. Now free fermions with this global symmetry, suppose you had free fermions with this as a global symmetry rather than as a gauge thing. Uh, then, then it's known that they can form topological band structure, and it turns out that uh, we know from the classification of topological band structures that it's classified by Z, and it's indexed by an, by an integer N. But for our purposes, what we need is what happens when there are strong interactions. And it's also known from work that we did earlier last year that with interactions, the Z classification in three dimensions with this symmetry collapses to a Z8 classification. Uh, so, so only n equals zero to seven are distinct phases. And amongst these, it's also known from uh, our earlier work that n equals four is protected just by time reversal and not by the full U1 cross time reversal. That means, so the final implication is that if we take this kind of topological insulator and we gauge the U1 to get a spin liquid, then only n equals zero, one, or two give distinct U1 spin liquids. And we know exactly what these are. Uh, uh, we can distinguish, oh, I think I'm sort of battery, sort of battery. Anyway, so, so we can distinguish these different ends by the, by the different effects on the E particles. Uh, when N equals zero is the simplest case, E is a Kramer singlet boson. N equals one, it turns out as a theta equals pi response. But now, what's forming your topological insider is the magnetic monopole, so there's a uh, with an effect of the dual particle. So the electric charge now uh, uh, gets endowed with a magnetic charge of half. So this phase is dual to the other phase that I described. And finally, when n is two, this electric charge just becomes a Kramer's doublet boson, and that's it. Okay. So this, uh, with the fermionic monopole, there's then three distinct phases uh, corresponding to these three distinct possibilities that I've described. And in total, putting everything together, that's the promised list of eight phases. Okay? Five, where the monopole is a boson, and three, where the monopole is a fermion. Okay? And we understand the physics of all these phases quite well 
We understand the structure of the loop gas wave functions that describe these different phases. In some case, in the electric representation, in some case, the magnetic representation. Uh, and we understand you know, the interfaces between these phases as well. Exactly, yeah, that's right. So now let's, after all this understanding, let's return to quantum spin eyes. Right? So what can we, what, based on these lessons, you know, what lessons have we learned? Uh, now presumably, the monopole will be a boson. There are these three in, one out, defect, tetrahedra. It's, uh, you know, the magnetic field lines, if the monopole had to be a fermion, then the magnetic field lines will have to have this ribbon structure, and the wave function must have these self-linking phases. Right? That doesn't seem to be the case if it's derived out of a, what's predominantly a spin ice Hamiltonian. Uh, now there's two, dis uh, so the monopole will be a boson, so we have to think about which one of those five phases are uh, uh, appropriate. Now if, now again, there's two distinction, there's a distinction that one has to make. Uh, these two class of materials, the ytterbium titanate and the pseudimium based materials are different microscopically because the spin that forms the spin ice transforms differently under time reversal in the two cases. In one case, it's what's known as the Kramer's doublet. So the degeneracy is protected by uh, time reversal through, Kramer, it's a Kramer's degeneracy. When in the pseudimium case, it's what's known as the non-Kramer's doublet. The degeneracy can be lifted by, say, strain or things of that sort. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in the Kramer's doublet case, uh, uh, one can argue that uh, either the CBMB phase or one of these other phases with electric charge is a Kramer's doublet or the likely ones, right? While uh, in, in the non Kramer's doublet case, uh, those uh, uh, the simplest phase EBMB or this other phase where the electric charge is a simple fermion without any Kramer structure or the likely ones. So in this Kramer's uh, uh, case, in this uh, ytterbium titanate, uh, you know, most of the existing theoretical literature has assumed that it's the CBMB phase, but I think there's a possibility that it's one of these other three phases. Experimentally, yeah. Right. A Kramer's doublet. No, the spins are still bosons, but the two-fold degeneracy of the icing spin, what protects the two-fold degeneracy? Right? Does that state transform as a Kramer's doublet? That's the question. Right? That's a chemistry question. It's not a, it, is it a spin half spin, or is it formed from an integer spin? You know, it's that difference. Right? In pseudimium, there's J equals four or something, while in, uh, I forget what it is in ytterbium, but it's a half integer spin. No, no. So whether or not the microscopic spin is a Kramer's doublet has nothing to do. Uh, the spin is always a boson, and T squared acting on physical states is always plus one in both cases. But it's, this is a different distinction. It's uh, a bit confusing because Kramer's, the word Kramer's shows up in both for chem, at the chemistry level. But it's, you know, it's a question of whether microscopically it's a half integer spin system or an integer spin system. So that's the distinction. If, but even a half integer spin system is really a boson system with t squared equals plus one. Anyway, so in the first case, uh, if it's one of these other phases, you will see two thresholds for continuum scattering in a neutron experiment, one associated with the defect tetrahedra, and the other associated with the electric gap, if he is Kramer's, and so on and so forth. So let me wind up. I uh, want to make a couple of remarks about um, uh, you know, some of the Things that we've learned, some of the other things that we've learned. Uh, as I indicated in many places, the different time reversal symmetric Q1 spin liquids can all be obtained from one another by starting with a, the, the simplest U1 spin liquid where both E and M are simple bosons, and then gradually make endowing one or the other uh, emergent uh, point particle. Uh, with topological, you know, putting them in topological insulators, interacting topological insulators. So the point of view uh, that's very powerful in this entire exercise, that these various U1 spin liquids can be viewed as gauge versions 
of interacting topological insulators of bosons of fermions. So this point of view is potentially very, very powerful you know, in the future for addressing questions that we currently don't, till recently, we didn't know how to even start formulating. For instance, if you want to understand a phase transition between two of these phases, for instance, between EBMB B and EFMB, that phase transition is associated with the change of the statistics of the E particle. Right? Clearly, there's no order parameter or anything. It's two dis different spin liquid phases with different statistics for the E particle. So how should we think about a statistics changing quantum phase transition? Right? So till recently, it was not clear. But now we have at least one idea. Because we know that these two phases can be viewed as uh, uh, the, the same kind of uh, U1 spin liquid, but where the bosonic monopole is either in a trivial insulator or is in a topological insulator. Okay? So we can view this transition as a gauged version of a trivial to topological insulator phase transition. Okay? And you know, it, it seems possible, it seems likely, uh, I don't know if it's likely, it seems that this, this way of thinking about it may help us make progress by thinking about trivial to topological insulator phase transitions, which, which is a problem that we may be able to handle, uh, and then gauging it help us understand weird phenomena like statistics changing phase transitions. So finally, I've only talked about the U1 spin liquid here, but there's a huge and developing literature on symmetry implementation and gap spin liquids. Now in gap spin liquids, all kinds of weird things can happen. Uh, you can have fractionalization of symmetry quantum numbers. The uh, formal way to say that is that the symmetry is realized projectively rather than linearly. Uh, but something even more dramatic can happen. Symmetry operations may even exchange different topological sectors in a gap spin liquid. There are many examples of that. There's, a, there's huge progress in the last year or two in understanding these kinds of phenomena in two dimensions in gap phases. Uh, three dimensions, it's still incomplete, but there's some, there's some attempts at progress. Uh, what I've talked to you about is a gapless phase, a U1 spin liquid in three dimensions with a particularly simple symmetry, time reversal. And here I think we can understand everything. All right, let me stop here. Until yeah. I see a little bit of a catch-22 situation here, in the sense that we start with a spin wave theory and say that the theory matches very well with experiment. And then we go on to propose another theory to explain the same system. Uh, does the spin wave theory uh, leave out certain things that you want to explain? or No, 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 no. Because no. that so is what you use to establish the quantum effects in the spin ice. Right. So, so let, uh, uh, I guess that went too fast. But let, so let me clarify exactly what's going on. So the way you determine the spin Hamilton, the way people determine the spin Hamiltonian is to take ytterbium titanate and put it in a magnetic field of a few tesla. Uh, because all the exchange constants are a few Kelvin, a few tesla field is enough to fully polarize the system. And then you do inelastic neutron scattering and study single spin flip excitations. And then you fit that, the dispersion, to an underlying Hamiltonian and stack the parameters. Okay? Now the rest. So that's to extract the parameters of the Hamiltonian at zero field. Okay? Now the rest of the story is about what happens at zero field when the spins are not fully polarized, but the spins are fluctuating. Right? Now the zero field system, we don't know what it does. Uh, empirically, there's some spin freezing, but there's also this continuum scattering. and that, So all the proposals are about what happens in zero field. The high field is a trick that's used to determine the Hamiltonian. And so the spin wave calculation is done in high fields where it's legitimate to do so. More questions? Yeah, so I have a naive question regarding terminology. I mean, this monopole that you spoke about in this case, is it closely related to the, what we call the monopole if you switch off the quantum uh, mechanical terms in the Hamiltonian, or is it uh, something entirely different? Uh, it, it's the same thing. It's a three-in-one-out tetrahedra. Yeah. So, 
So, I mean, what would be the effective interaction if you uh, separated the oppositely charged uh, uh, monopoles. magnetic monopoles by distance? Right. So, if it is a spin liquid, then the effective interaction will be a 1 over R interaction. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit that I'm uh, a bit confused about because in the classical spin eyes, mm -hmm. in order to get an effective interaction of 1 by R, you had to include the dipolar interactions. If the dipolar interactions had not been there, Right, so, so in the quantum yeah. case, the yeah. question is whether quantum fluctuations can give the magnetic field lines, uh, keep them tensionless, and allow them to fluctuate. Right. So the assumption is that indeed that can happen. And we know that that can happen in some limit of that Hamiltonian. If you take, if you take the XXZ pyrochlor spin half Hamiltonian, there, and if the XX couplings are small enough, that's, uh, I mean, I, I guess that's a proposal of Fermi et al. and what Kedar's numeric showed is that indeed it goes into this uh, U1 spin liquid phase where the magnetic field lines have no line tension. Right? And then the inter-monopole interaction will be one over all. If you have static monopole. There is a correspondence between the loop structure of the spin ice uh, constraints and uh, large and gauge theories. Has yes. it been used to study any analogies or predictions? I don't know. It's a strong coupling expansion connection. Mm -hmm. um. There are no further questions. Let's thanks until again. <laughs>